Sister Vasa, why don't you uh, take a mo few moments and, and share whatever is on your mind? All right, thank you, Nicholas. Uh, thanks for inviting me to this get together. Uh, well, I have been very emotional as many of us around here throughout this Lent uh, that has been, uh, well, it, it, it hit, hits us close to home here in Austria, the war, and we're flooded by refugees also, you know, sh sharing their stories, uh, refugees also in need. Uh, we're witnessing a lot of light despite of the darkness. We see a lot of people rising to the occasion, our Austrian neighbors helping out, you know, these many people in need now. We're weeping together with them as well. And those of us who are Russian, <laughs> just you know find ourselves feeling at times like like something inside has died uh, as we continuously see you know death bringing information um and i feel like these ukrainians with whom we've become so close now are dying inside at the same time there are obviously people also literally uh dying and being raped, uh, you know, pillaged, um, violated in all sorts of ways. And we're seeing also the PTSD in the eyes of the children here uh, and the, the mothers, most, you know, and the grandparents that are in our midst now. Uh, and we feel that we're all traumatized uh, and not really our usual selves. Uh, so it makes me think about the the overquoted, you know, intro to A Tale of Two Cities, uh, where it's, you know, the best of times and the worst of times and a time of light and a time of darkness. And it's a time of, you know, this kind of, I feel like we're being called to rediscover the basics as we usually are during the Lenten period, where we go back to the basics, we exile ourselves even into the reality of the Old Testament, you know, before uh, there's more Old Testament, there's fewer divine liturgies and so forth. Um, but we rediscover our humanity and, you know, where it all began. We, you know, in the first few weeks of Lent, we have these basic <laughs> readings about the very beginnings. And something that spoke to me in a very different way was when uh, you know, a couple of weeks ago, we read about, uh, you know, it was Genesis 4, uh, you know, fratricide, the first sin of the first human born to humans, right? Uh, and this spoke to me in a different way. And I thought our entire redemption is about uh, our Lord absorbing our ultimately murderous uh, will when divorced from God, right? Uh, and he absorbs that murderous will uh, and also shares responsibility by, you know, allowing himself to be executed at our hands, but he's executed amongst the worst of the worst criminals. And so when people say, you know, we don't really believe in shared responsibility as one hears a lot of analysts saying, um, I think that, as a Christian, one always, uh, you know, co-carries responsibility. I mean, people think that's like more of a Gibran-esque uh, approach to, you know, crime committed in uh, our society or on in our world. But I think, yes, some of us might feel shared responsibility, maybe in a sense, you know, because we're Russian. Uh, but as Christians, as Orthodox, I think that this is a wake-up call um, and, uh, you know, a, a call for us to look at what, you know, if we just don't, you know, we've been talking about this with, you know, on various uh, platforms now. In connection with this war, we've been also talking about the, well, the wars going on between Orthodox jurisdictions, patriarchates. Uh, and I feel that this war has somehow forced us 
to see how ultimately fratricidal also those battles are because you know it's all it's all fun right the canonical battles until as they say until people start dying and it seems to me like this this the explosion into fratricide of a lot of this bundle of things that's basically you know expansionism um it's uh it's it's shown me anyway that this is a this is serious business it's it's the sin of cain and because it's lent it, it seems to me like uh it's a time for yeah for for a lot of soul searching and reassessment for us you know uh i am finishing now so uh, just one more thing uh the the kinds i'm experiencing also this deja vu uh with regard to the way the argumentation is playing out the way the propaganda is working uh and also the interplay of you know the 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 west with facing that uh propaganda machine from that side i'm, I'm thinking about the 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 uh you know invasion of afghanistan back in the cold war years back in you know 79 and then in the uh the whole the, the argumentation basically it wasn't only in, in connection with Af afghanistan sorry i do promise one more minute um but the Brezhnev doctrine and the the logic you know behind it sort of and the the justification of things uh you know and retrospectively say the invasion of czechoslovakia and then the backup of it with the theology of peace on the pages of the journal moskovsky patriarchy of the journal of the moscow patriarchate and the way we would observe uh a lot of this playing out the way theological uh argumentation was being given to it uh, I feel like this is in in certain ways repeating itself. And then there were a lot of what about isms later on also in this whole discussion of what about, you know, later on it was being said, what about America in Vietnam? And what about, you know, because of a, a lot of the war crimes being committed in Afghanistan, they, they were saying, okay, so I'm stopping now abruptly, but um, I feel that there is a, a you know, there's a, there are symptoms repeating themselves uh, in this situation today. Thank you, sister. Uh, Father Deacon, would you like to share your thoughts? Um, yes, thank you. I um, uh, Well, I'm, I'm honored to be here. Um, I think that possibly this is my first um, Orthodox, well, it, it, because it's the Orthodox Peace Fellowship thing where I've actually spoken about this, because very often I'm speaking to... Um, uh, outside the family, as it were. So um, this is this is really, um, in a way, uh, a healing thing for me to 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 in a way try to understand. Um, and I I actually I, I spoke to a friend the other night, uh, and we were talking about uh, the sense of shared responsibility. And um, uh, I'll just mention briefly because um, Nicholas, you asked me to mention this declaration, which I was one of the people who penned. And this is a declaration against uh, the Russian world teaching. I won't get into the details of the Russian world teaching, but you can look on uh, online. Um, and it's now rather taken off in in a way that I I certainly couldn't have expected. It's it's in eighteen languages, um, and there's Chinese on the way. Um, and um, uh, over 1,300 signatures. And this comes out of my sense of responsibility, certainly for the Orthodox Church, but also when I joined the Orthodox Church, as you can tell, because I don't have a traditionally Orthodox name, uh, I joined in the 1990s when I was very young. And I joined in the OCA, so I was very much uh, within uh, sort of uh, 
Russian type circles. I then was in the Moscow Patriarchate after I um, went to seminary at St. Vladimir's from 2003 to 2015, and then until it was dissolved um, uh, under the Ecumenical Patriarchate, I was in um, the, the Russian Archdiocese in Paris. So I have this emotional bond, as it were, to this tradition. And, but it's more than that. And my friend, uh, as it were, challenged me when I spoke to her the other night. And it, it reminds me of this uh, wonderful quote uh, from, uh, well, from Dostoevsky, from the brothers Karamazov, uh, where um, the father Zazima uh, says that there is only one means of salvation. And this is to make yourself responsible for all men's sins, for all human beings' sins, for everything and for everyone. And I remember back when I, I first was becoming Orthodox, and I was reading um, a lot of the lives of, of the saints, Saint Seraphim of Sarov. I remember I read it in, in um, a Platina uh, version, the little Russian Falakalia. And it said that um, Saint Seraphim uh, uh, kneeled on a stone uh, for a thousand days and nights um, because the world, if I remember the thing, the, the language, the world was riven with wars. The world was riven with wars. And this made me think um, also by another friend who sent out a homily um, uh, just uh, today um, that in some sense, the aestheticism that we go through is a corporate uh, aestheticism. It is something we all do when we're in the services. We do um, the prayer of St. Ephraim together. Um, when we do good deeds, um, as we are a part of the body of Christ, this will um, enliven that body. It will fill up what is lacking, as it were, in the Lord's sufferings. This will, uh, as it were, um, transform the world, but we can only do that together. But likewise, when um, we do evil, when each of us, uh, uh, and obviously we're not necessarily engaged in war, but let's say when we act arrogantly, when we, um, uh, as it were, almost kind of anesthetize or turn off our heart when somebody turns towards us, all the little things, this evil also affects the body. So in a way, our responsibility is total and the gift of asceticism is total. It's an asceticism for all, uh, just as we are given responsibility by God uh, for all things, so too he gives us a gift of uh, how to be healed together. So uh, in a way, what I saw in terms of this declaration, it, it in a way is a symbol for me of what really we should be doing is it, that taking responsibility and going to our own house and saying, you know, you know what is going on? The situation, some people have said, oh, the declaration is anti-Russian. Well, I don't take it as such. I take it as a call for repentance. And indeed the cover letter that was written by Pantelis Kelicides and I, um, this is, is a call for repentance. It says that we must be responsible for all. We must look at each one of our houses, each one of the traditions, and stop fighting about turf um, and become responsible for each one of, uh, of us for our salvation together. Thank you, Father Deacon. Uh, Sergey, would you like to share your thoughts? Yes, thank you. Thank you for the invitation. Um, well, our, I think there are two, um, uh, uh, two points that are, are important. And first of all, we see that our institutional churches, uh, official churches, in fact, are uh, very slow and almost um, unable to uh, give uh, a... Uh, clear Christian position on uh, what's going on in uh, uh, Ukraine. And this war uh, is a challenge for, for all the Orthodox churches and all uh, Christian communities. Uh, but, uh, and we can, of course, criticize the uh, Russian Orthodox Church, and um, we do. Uh, but I think the most important thing is um, personal perspective. 
and um, I see how many problems have those who are trying to speak we instead of I um, uh, during these days. Uh, and this, 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 this personal perspective uh, is, uh, uh, um, is a challenge for a Christian because we, we try to sort of associate ourselves with uh, uh, our communities. And we, uh, uh, when we see that the communities are saying something wrong, or at least keeping silence, then what should, should I do? What should be my position? Uh, and um, uh, for me, as a uh, member of the Russian Orthodox Church for uh, uh, at least last uh, 35 years, uh, mm -hmm. uh, it's really a big problem uh, to, 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 to sort of to say uh, uh, who I am and where I am in this situation as, as a member of my local church. Uh, so um, um, I don't have the clear answer to, to this question. Um, I would like to say, uh, I'm trying, and we need, uh, we need even, uh, a new language uh, to describe or to describe this uh, situation. Uh, and I think that, um, at least in Russia, uh, we, uh, our reality is that um, under the title uh, of the Russian Orthodox Church, uh, we are unite, uh, uh, combine two things that uh, we cannot sort of combine anymore. Uh, the official church, which is the kind of the, 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 the tool the propaganda tool of the Russian state and the uh, real Christian communities, basically on the grassroots level, that are sort of that are trying to live Christian life, uh, that are trying to live according to the gospel, uh, and we don't hear this uh, uh, second voice. The, 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 this, this voice uh, is is very uh, uh, is very weak um, and. Um, uh, could, could I, again, the, in this personal perspective, could I justify uh, the, the, the silence of these uh, thousands or dousands of thousands of uh, communi communities all over Russia? Uh, communities uh, that have priests and parishioners uh, uh, from um, Ukraine and you know, in Russia, we have lots of uh, priests uh, that uh, came uh, to Russia from uh, from Ukraine and Western Ukraine in Soviet period, and we uh, we are somehow th th this Ukrainian tradition is a part of um, um, Russian tradition for at least last uh, 40, 50 years. So, um, why these people are keeping silence? Uh, I have the only answer that they are afraid. Uh, priests are afraid to be uh, uh, punished and even uh, defrocked. Um, they, they are afraid. Um, yesterday night I talked to one uh, priest in Moscow and he said, well, uh, uh, I'm against the war. And I know that uh, the vast majority of my uh, friends who are also priests in Moscow, they are against the war. Uh, but our, uh, the, our bishops are sort of trying to sort of to put pressure on us, saying that we should, uh, uh, in our sermons, we should support the war. And we're trying sort of uh, to keep silence uh, about that. And that's maximum what we can do, because otherwise we will be just, uh, um, we, will leave our, we will leave our position. And of course we can do that. Uh, but what about people in our parish who will come after us? Uh, the, uh, the quality of priests, especially of young priests, are, is, uh, is terrible. Uh, and... Um, we are afraid of our communities. We were sort of working with our community for our 10, 15, 20 years. Uh, uh, what will happen? So they, 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 they will sort of disappear. Um, 
and I can understand this um, sort of uh, this position. I can. Uh, it's difficult to justify it, but it. Um, I can understand it. Uh, this is one thing. Uh, the other thing is uh, the the problem with um, um, I would say with, uh, with the kind of the the, expre the experience of prayer uh, that uh, I have is not relevant uh, to uh, what I see and uh, what I feel uh, right now. Uh, yesterday we had the great canon and this uh, wonderful Byzantine um, liturgical uh, poetry, uh, in fact, is uh, irrelevant uh, to uh, at least, th that's my personal perspective, um, uh, to, to what I feel and uh, how my heart would like to pray right now. And... Um, uh, you know, the, the, the pious tradition is the, uh, that we should be calm and we should sort of not involve our sort of, uh, we should not pray emotionally, but I think that's the time to uh, let emotions be a part of prayer because otherwise uh, the, the prayer uh, wouldn't be sincere. Uh, and... Um, uh, that, that's that's really something new, uh, and this this um, uh, this this feeling that uh, the um, uh, the world, the comfortable world, the comfortable spiritual world uh, that we built during last uh, years uh, is not there anymore. And um, I think the the declaration that. Um, uh, Brandon and other theologians uh, wrote uh, during these first days of war is one of the is just one of the signs that um, our situation is uh, changing. And uh, the second, the, the uh, declaration of support of this declaration, that the, the, the Oxford statement, uh, which is also I think very important, is also an, a good sign that our not only this small group of theologians or this few thousand people that signed uh, the declaration, but uh, quite a lot of other people are have the same feeling that we have to rethink, revise our, uh, our uh, ecclesial and spiritual experience um, of, of, of the past in a way maybe that we don't really know how today. But if we will sort of question our experience and if we'll try to find the new words and new approaches, uh, then uh, maybe uh, we will be able to um, remain Christians uh, in these uh, terrible times. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, so I'll ask now that uh, our uh, participants in the audience, you can submit questions through the chat feature. Um, you can direct them to everyone or at the host and panelists. While we wait for those questions to come in, um, let me start with a question. So since we're the Orthodox Peace Fellowship, a question for all the panelists. Uh, what should Christians be doing to work for peace? How do we move from this moment of extreme division within the church, between nations of great anger, heartbreak, um, resentment, to a position of reconciliation? Yes, Brandon. I think, um, I mean, what, what Sergei said really sort of pointed at my heart, as it were. Um, uh, yes, I mean, when, when one reads the Psalms, you, you see a soul crying out. You see full emotion. Uh, and you see this in the prophets as well. So I think my, my response to that would be um, quite simple, which is the truth speak the truth. And that truth is, is that uh, the Orthodox Church is in crisis and has been um, in crisis for quite a while, but particularly um, after the fall of communism. We've, we've uh, basically can't deal with the modern world. And we, uh, a lot of the time we uh, try to hide in, um, 
you know, I'm thinking of the poet W.B. Yeats um, sailing to Byzantium in a gold mosaic of a wall, you know, as if we were some sort of unchanging, lost, you know, kind of sentimentalized um, vision of, of, of uh, the, our past glories, instead of actually facing with the reality, the truth of the situation. We, we, we argue um, over turf. We um, debate issues based on um, often highly uncontextualized canons that um, were created for the 5th, 6th, 7th, and 8th century. Um, this is prelest, to use a good Russian word. And we need to um, face up to the truth and speak the truth. And I think that the collaboration of um, the Moscow Patriarchate this is not nothing new. All of our churches do that. We refuse to speak the truth. Yes, uh, may I add a few words. Yes, I think that's the um, that's that's the main point, uh, and or at least the the starting point, uh, because it's it's extremely difficult uh, to. Uh, speak truth um, in our, our, our uh, ecclesial context. Uh, the, 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 the big problem is that we have our liturgy and we have a kind of um, um, uh, justification that when we have our, the uh, Eucharist, uh, this our, uh, 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 thanksgiving uh, uh, that let us uh, this uh, this this when 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 we celebrate liturgy uh, we can stay silent so we are praying for the whole world we are we are praying for friends and enemies uh, we are praying uh, we are praying for all uh, and um, it seems that uh, this this uh, uh, th th this how should I put it? It's a kind of paraliturgical uh, uh, justification uh, of uh, our weakness, of, of my weakness. That uh, if uh, if we if we have liturgy, uh, then we uh, everybody are united here. We can't come uh, to the liturgy uh, uh, with a kind of hatred, with a feeling that we uh, hate somebody. So we should be are in peace, uh, and that's the condition to uh, participate in prayer. And that means, uh, uh, from from this uh, from this kind of say standard uh, bias perspective, that when you're getting out of the church, you should still be uh, sort of uh, quiet, and uh, the truth, in fact, um, is not necessary. So there's a kind of division between uh, moral uh, and religious. And um, at least in Russia, I see that uh, the, 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 this, is the, this is the main problem. Uh, how you could sort of uh, speak truth uh, if you are a true Christian? <laughs> uh, this question is uh, I don't know, stupid, paradoxical. Uh, but um, it is there. So quite a lot of people uh, still think uh, that they can uh, avoid uh, this duty uh, of uh, speaking truth. And we see that uh, this attempt to sort of to be silent is the uh, great temptation for, for, for millions of people. Thank you. Um, I'll, I'll go ahead. We've got a, quite a number of comments, um, uh, questions in the chat. So I'll, I'll go ahead and read the first three. Um, so the first question is about the famine in Ukraine during the early 1930s. Um, uh, so it's a more historical question about um, uh, the, the morality of this. The second question is, um, how should healing take place within the Moscow Patriarchate? Uh, should uh, Moscow Patriarch eight churches outside of Russia leave the jurisdiction? Should they stay and try to reform? And then the third question is about the uh, 
suggestion to remove the Russian Orthodox Church from the World Council of Churches. So you're welcome to take any of those three questions. Okay, let me maybe let, let I will start with a few remarks. Um, uh, as for our, well, we cannot force any our, uh, any community to stay uh, uh, in, within the Moscow Patriarchate or leave Moscow Patriarchate. That should be their own decision. Uh, and as far as I know, our, not only the our Saint Nicholas Parish in Amsterdam, but also our, another parish in Italy officially left uh, Moscow Patriarchate, and I saw the letter from uh, Archpriest uh, Vladimir Milnichuk to Metropolitan Antony of uh, Moscow Patriarchate stating that they left, uh, the parish decided to leave uh, Moscow Patriarchate, and in, uh, th that happened, so that they left. So we have the, now the second parish that um, is transferred to the Ecumenical Patriarchate. Um, we see only one bishop even outside uh, the Russian Federation of the Russian Orthodox Church, uh, Metropolitan and Kenti of Vilnius, who uh, was very firm stating that um, his position is uh, different from the position of uh, Patriarch Kirill, uh, but among these uh, hundreds of bishops there's only one uh, who was courageous and honest enough uh, uh, to speak out the truth. So, uh, in this situation, uh, I think our uh, communities are, um, that are, uh, for the moment, in the Moscow Patriarchate um, uh, could, could make any decision. Uh, and the decision to leave Moscow Patriarchate is, is um, at least understandable. Uh, as for the World Council of Churches, um, I think that uh, that's a very important uh, gesture from the ecumenical community, because um, Russian Church are um, have a um, uh, very uh, kind of special self understanding. They think that uh, the Russian Orthodox Church is the, the biggest uh, Orthodox Church in the world. Uh, at, and it will definitely stay uh, in touch with all the uh, religious communities uh, around the world, and, and the Russian Church can do anything, and this, this, this situation will not change. So they will be welcomed, uh, their delegation, Metropolitan Hilarion, will be welcomed in, in Vatican, um, will be welcomed in uh, the uh, Anglican Church, in the World Council of Churches, in the uh, um, Conference of European Churches, uh, so, th so they, they feel that uh, uh, nothing will. They could, they could, they could say anything, and nothing will change. And I think that's the right, uh, uh, the right time to to show no. If you are not speaking truth, if you are not able to uh, call the war, the war, though it, you will have, of course, juridical um, uh, problems afterwards, and you could be taken to uh, prison. Uh, but anyway, uh, you have to speak truth, and um, uh, if you are not speaking truth, and the uh, Christian community around the world is keeping silence about that, I think uh, that's a disaster. Thank you. Uh, Sister Vasso or uh, Deacon Brandon, would you like to comment on any, any of those questions? Um, I would. Uh, I think that when we question whether or not it's possible to be a Christian and not tell the truth, uh, I think that this uh, this is a strange uh, it's a strange conundrum to have when initially our primary vocation, as far as I I understand it, was to be martyrs. You will be my martyrs, right? I budite mne svidetili. Uh, you will be my martyrs. Uh, it's said already um, in Holy Scripture in Isaiah, I think. Uh, but it's what Christ says to his disciples, sending them out. So it's, it's a primary vocation of any Christian. And 
to say the truth with pain, you know, some of the, I know that it's a contested etymology of the word martyr, uh, but some would uh, say that it shares the root, you know, with uh, Schmerz, coming from words like, you know, Schmerz, pain in, in the German, but words in the Greek that are, you know, Merimnao and um, some other words that have to do with, well, also memory, the remem it's remembrance with pain. So martyr has to do with uh, a certain, uh, you know, group of words that has to do with remembering, being a witness also, right? Uh, but witnessing, even though you're gonna get in trouble for witnessing that you saw, you know, that you were there. It's like being a witness, you know, against, say, against somebody who's dangerous. Uh, so despite the pain we feel, it's uncomfortable. I was talking with my friend, Father John Baer the other day and saying, I, I feel uncomfortable talking about this when, as uh, as uh, Sergei Chopin said, you know, I feel uncomfortable because my church doesn't seem to be, you know, backing me up on saying this. It doesn't feel good. It doesn't feel, uh, it, you know, it feels uncomfortable. And Father John said, well, when one does that, um, it, it, it causes us pain. And martyrdom has to do with pain. It has to do with testimony. And this discomfort is something, if we are cross carriers, I suppose should not come as a surprise, right? We shouldn't be surprised that, that sometimes we have to carry the cross and shed blood, you know, like when, when does it get important, you know? And when oftentimes, a person probably doesn't have to maybe even more than their more than once in their lives have to stand in the way of you know sort of i don't know stand in the way of some evil right um but you know we never expected it but you know we we spent a lot of us spent our lives you know talking about the new martyrs of russia and growing up in an age with that glorified them and the Moscow Patriarch, it would also claim to be the church of those martyrs, right? Embracing that, that's who that, you know, they saved the church somehow. And, and, and then the day comes when, you know, when we have to, we have to simply say, you know, or not lie, right? And, and confess, say with confession, right? Uh, is is to say together with with whom with the church right so the fact that certain people in the church aren't saying the truth does not mitigate or diminish the church right and i think that some of the symbolism that's been demonstrated in this war that that uh some people don't really understand the concept of seeing the symbolism in historic events, right? But there is a symbolism in the names that are popping up, just like we say, you know, that the town of Bethlehem means house of bread, even though you could say that's just an accident of history that something happened there that made it a house of bread, right? So a certain someone was born there who gave us his own self as, uh, you know, the bread of the world. Anyway, we have a town like a city like Mariupol, meaning the city of Mary, right? Being really absorbing like the most aggression in this horrific explosion of evil, the, the hatred, the fratricidal hatred that's been building up, right? In this, in this, this uh, evil uh, entity that has divorced itself from God, that has erected idols, right? Instead of toppling them. And Mary, who is the image classically and traditionally of the mother church, she is there absorbing it. Why? Because she is in the communion of the saints, a cross carrier. She also carries the cross with her son and her compassion is there for all to see. And the Pope had the healthy instinct, even though I was no big fan of being consecrated, 
uh, without being asked to the Immaculate Heart of Mary, but God bless him, it was a healthy instinct to uh, promote, sort of make, to, to draw attention to uh, the name of the mother of God in the context of the war, right? So we have this symbol of the city of Mary, what can be more symbolic of the church, that is co-suffering, regardless of what the people, uh, certain people in the church say, because for a long time, as lay people, we have, and monastics are lay people, even so, some people don't understand that, uh, it's, we think that lay people are less church, right, ever since uh, the, this absurd, ad absurdum, episcopization of our church occurred, right, and in late Byzantium, it only got worse when the no, when the emperor ceased to be, because, you know, having donned the mitre and everything else and the sakwas, we had little emperors in every diocese then, you know, instead of just one Byzantine emperor, we have an emperor, basically the priests eventually caught on how to also become tzad ibuch in every parish. But uh, aside from that, we as lay people ought, do share responsibility for that because we are passive. We think that it's the only thing that the church is doing is what the, we say, even though some of us have spoken about this, right? But it doesn't matter because until a bishop says it, it doesn't matter. None of this is church. We're not church, right? Church is when the guy in the funny hat says something. But what kind of a vision of church is that, right? Isn't the church, the people in Mariupol that are shedding their blood, absorbing this, this horrific, uh, this horrific fratricidal hate? right? Um, and then we have the symbol also, I mentioned toppling idols, if I didn't mention it, uh, I mean that I mentioned uh, uh, whatever, I've heard it mentioned also in the past weeks. Um, we have, we have, if we, if we as church recognize that we have erected idols in the place, or surrogates in the place of where our one and only Lord should be, we might look at the symbolism of the name Vladimir, in the context of this war. Vladimir, Veliki Knaz Vladimir is, 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 uh, my vo Velichayim kak idoli pa pravshaga. We, uh, we, we celebrate him as the toppler of idols. And when we see the Vladimirs, they, their name keeps popping up. There's Vladimir Putin, there's Volodymyr Zelensky. I might also mention what the given name is of Patriarch Kirill. It is Vladimir. His parents named him Vladimir, but that name is not symbolically popping up in a reference to him. But if we think about Idoli Papravshi, Vladimir, you know, Kievsky Knaz and all of this stuff, we start thinking, what is, who is toppling idols and who is erecting them? right? Because that's the big battle going on, right? It's the battle that th it's been a process for us. It's a, it, sometimes it's a daily process to topple your idols, right? Because they creep up again like mushrooms or something. Um, so we see one of these Lizimirs, the one in Moscow, I uh, apologize if anybody doesn't see this, um, who has allowed after, you know, after the, the, a few years in the Yeltsin era, when Russia just a little bit started to soul search, uh, come to terms with the past, which really never happened, either, neither in pre-revolutionary Russia or post-Soviet uh, Russia, it never really happened. You know, there was never this big work on, to come to terms. I don't think the Orthodox Church ever came to terms either with our problematic past, I, as I think Brandon said. Um, you know, we have no responsibility for the great schism. That was all. The Catholics fell away from us, who sat, uh, who sat on the mountain, you know, and uh, continued to sit there um, peacefully uh, and triumphantly it's only the triumph of orthodoxy that we seem to remember. But anyway, uh, we have in, in Russia, in, as Putin came to power, all of the, the beginning process of, you know, opening up the documents, the archives, um, even starting to question what the Vilika, the great victory, you know, the Vilika Pobeda, was it really so Vilika? Was it actually, was there any strategy or were... <laughs> Russian boys just, their blood was drowning the Germans. That, that was our strategy. Drown the Germans in Russian blood. We have plenty of these Russians, you know, like that's, this was the strategy. This was our, you know, great victory. But anyway, 
there were questions, you know, historians like uh, Shkarovsky, uh, an old friend of mine, I don't know even if he's still around, but um, anyway, so we began to, to, to look at this, but then in the Putin era, this all gets rolled back, full speed backwards. The red, uh, very early on, the red flags return, hammer and sickle. We have a whole temple erected, everybody knows about it by now, the Cathedral of the Armed Forces, where sadly the patriarch had this big liturgical, or whatever you want to call it, celebration um, just recently. Um, we have uh, literally idols being erected, right, under this Vladimir that's in Moscow. And um, we have uh, this complete, you know, turning away from what we were beginning to do uh, to, to repent, right? Meanwhile, Volodymyr, another Vladimir Zelensky, has joined and led his people to, uh, to turn away from its Soviet also past and uh, other elements of its past to, to move forward and to also to sacrifice in order to do that, right? These people are not escaping the costs of doing that because they could have surrendered, right? They don't have to be shedding their blood as they are. They don't have to be so desperately defending the, the rubble, excuse me, that is Mariupol. There's nothing left. And there's these people who are slandered, who are called Nazis, these boys in this Azov thing, you know, being slandered as, as these great Nazis. Um, the sacrifice, which sacrifice meaning making holy, we're called right now to be made holy, to sacrifice from Tzatzer and Fatsere. So it's not a, a, an extraordinary thing to demand of Christians, like, do you want to be holy? Do you want to also help uh, make, uh, you know, the, the, to, to save the world? Um, so anyway, uh, I, some of these thoughts, uh, you know, come to mind with all of this, the, these uh, interesting symbols, signs being sent our way. Thank you. Um, I'll get uh, Deacon Brandon. You have your, yeah. um, well, thank you, um, sister. It's very moving. Um, one of the questions that was asked was about the WCC, and I think it's it's fair to try to give a stab at that. Um, uh, Elizabeth Theokratov has rightly pointed out, you know, that there is a danger if you um, isolate a church. Um, as it were, you know, you you take them away from from other influences, as it were. Um, so I do respect that. But one thing I do know from being a student of history, and, and particularly of of um, reading about the life of Patriarch Kirill, is is that he and the Moscow Patriarchate have a long history of using official ecumenical bodies and using ecumenism as um, a way of promoting, frankly, propaganda. And, um, uh, and so um, I would say if the Moscow Patriarchate is to remain in um, official bodies like the WCC, then the WCC needs to actually challenge. So I saw somewhere, perhaps on Twitter, that um, Metropolitan Alarion um, uh, who's the head of the Department of External Church Relations, was going to be um, giving some sort of talk, um, I think at, at a pre-conciliar uh, sort of before the major assembly in preparation on the love of Christ um, uh, and uh, the sorts of things that were completely at odds with, of course, with the sort of bellicose rhetoric that is being used uh, by, not by him, I might add, but, but by many people in his church. So I would say, fine, keep the WCC as uh, the Moscow Patriarchate as a part of that. But the other members need to, coming back to this idea of responsibility, take responsibility for um, the Moscow Patriarchate as a Christian church and ask it, you know, how is it going to act in a Christian manner? So often, and here 
we uh, maybe this is about erecting uh, idols and tearing them down. So often in the Orthodox Church, in my, I guess it's been nearly 30 years, so more than half of my life, I've been in the Orthodox Church. And so often I find that we as Orthodox are very, very concerned with uh, being Orthodox and not enough concerned with being Christian. And I, I'll say that again. Um, we may be Orthodox, but are we Christian? Are we actually following um, Christ? We're, we, we're very, very keen on, on uh, you know, kind of beating our chest and uh, doing so, I might add, in, you know, with, with perfect apathia, to return to what uh, Sergei was saying, you know, uh, passionless, uh, uh, less, you know, in a, in a sort, of, uh, sort of holy state. Uh, but um, often we don't act like martyrs. We don't image the crucified. We don't uh, reach out to uh, our brothers and sisters. Instead, we spend our time condemning other groups as less, uh, you know, kind of true. Uh, and, and so what I see in this kind of collapse of uh, church and state in this sort of theology of empire or whatever you're going to say, this, this sort of culture wars type uh, vision is I see really what exists in so many other places in the Orthodox Church, where we are, as one of my teachers, um, John Erickson said at St. Vladimir, we are Eucharistized pagans. We um, uh, are completely sacralized. We, we, are, we, we have the liturgy and the whole um, sort of spiritual tradition kind of going into our main vein like we were kind of almost addicted to it like junkies but we don't actually live out the gospel of jesus christ we don't pay attention to the fathers we quote them but we don't live them and so in that sense um what i would say is keep well i quoted i quoted dickens brandon just yes so. well it in and that applies as well Keep the Moscow Patriarchate in the um, World Council of Churches, but other Christian churches must challenge it as to whether it is living out its Christian vocation. And um, yeah, thanks. Thank you. Uh, so well, we're actually, nearing. Uh, sorry, let, let me say yes, first. Go ahead. Actually, I don't believe that within the uh, World Council of Churches. Uh, there are actors, uh, there are um, uh, those who uh, can really make our Russian church uncomfortable within the WCC. That's, uh, that's, that's the point. Uh, I would like to uh, uh, be mistaken. Um, there's a funny uh, historical factoid uh, about when, you know, in the beginning of the Nikodim era, the Moscow Patriarchate entered into the World Council of Churches. I don't think, I'm not sure if it's what, 1960 or so, 61. You might know this better, other panelists. Um, but in the archives of the Rokor, I saw uh, correspondence that uh, was explaining from, uh, we had an Archbishop, Antonio Zhenevsky, who wanted the Rokor at that point to enter the World Council of Churches, but the World Council of Churches let us know in the Roe Corps that the Moscow Patriarchate put down, well, had the, the terms that were, they will not enter if the Roe Corps is allowed to be a member. Now, because that's an interesting reason for the Roe Corps going down a path of isolation, like you said, uh, Brandon, it's not good for the to isolate further the Moscow Patriarchate, right? Um, but they could not, they would not sit at the same table with the Rokor back then. And um, sadly, I don't think that the Rokor is any more someone that they're uncomfortable to sit at the table with, right? Because we've been neutralized effectively. Thank you. So we're nearing the end of our time, but I did want to highlight a few extra questions and give our panelists time for concluding thoughts. 
Um, so there were some wonderful questions about a truth and reconciliation committee, about um, uh, fasting and prayer and, and charity, um, some very detailed questions about the Ruski Mir statement, but about two thirds of the questions were about um, practical advice for how to talk to other Orthodox Christians during this time. So a number of questions about challenging propaganda, uh, a couple of questions about uh, you know, silence within the church, um, particularly what do you do if you've been instructed by a priest or a bishop to not talk about such things? Um, a couple of questions about the situation in Russia, whether there's any pushback from the laity. Um, so I'll invite you to reflect on any of those questions, practical advice, anything else that you've seen in the chat you'd like to respond to and, and give your closing thoughts. Propaganda. Uh, as far as propaganda goes, a lot of people think that the propaganda is trying to win trust as far as the, the, the Kremlin prop propaganda goes. Uh, people think that it works in this way. We're saying the truth, they're lying. Western media, lying. But that's not the way it works. The propaganda machine always floats several different narratives at once. So if you try to even see what the actual motivation and justification of this war is, the you know, in Putin's speech on February 24th, it was two reasons, denazification, demilitarization. Then we have additional, um, you know, threats, uh, you know, that supposedly it was provoked by NATO somehow, you know, uh, somehow threatening aggression and so forth. Um, but the purpose is because see the, to really convince you that there is no truth here. You can't, you know, this is all ambivalent. Um, and so it justifies your inaction because it's not worth, say, going into opposition or, you know, even risking your life going out in the streets when you're not sure, is this true? Is that true? So it's not a matter of, you know, trust Putin. People don't trust him. We see that the Russian people don't trust him. Uh, they might voice support for him, but when it when their health or their lives is at stake, they won't even take the, you know, the vaccine uh, that he was promoting. Uh, they certainly don't want to go and die in this uh, special operation uh, in Ukraine, as we see a lot of people have fled, you know, the country uh, in case th there is mobilization. Anyway, uh, so it's not a matter of trusting him. It's don't trust anybody. And then you can justify your inaction. So this is exactly what's happening when Pilate, uh, Pontius Pilate says, quid est veritas, what is truth, even though the truth about to be crucified is staring him in the face, already bloody and, and uh, beaten, right? But what is truth? And he washes his hands. So this is what con continues to happen when you refuse to take responsibility for actually seeing truth, right? And so I think when we speak to people who throw that phrase at you and say, no, you know what? That side is also, and what about this side saying this? Everything is not clear here. So sit back, don't watch the news, pray. This is this false uh, position you're put in. So we shouldn't be bullied by this phrase. We should expose this phrase for what it is. No, as a responsible Christian, I know that there is truth. I don't say what is truth as if that's a rhetorical question. If I believe in salvation history, in the existence of revelation, I'm not either a, a, you, like agnostic of Ukrainian war news, right? And I'm not an agnostic. I don't say that it's not knowable what the truth is, right? God reveals himself through history. And if there is a God, then there is a truth. And on the receiving end of God's truth are re response able, able to respond human beings. So no one, I think, is released from the responsibility of figuring out where light is and where darkness is here. And we shouldn't be bullied into this 
nor should we be dismissed from responsibility. We don't know what the truth is, so everybody be quiet and sit this one out. Thank you. Very powerful. Uh, Sergey or Father Deacon, would you like to give your closing remarks? Sergey, you can go first. Okay, thank you. Well, I think the, uh, the, 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 the point for reflection, the, 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 the important point for reflection is that blessed uh, are the peacemakers. So not just those who pray for peace, uh, but those who make peace. And uh, what does that mean uh, for me uh, in, in my position? What does that mean to be a peacemaker? I think that's that's the, the that's the very uh, personal question, and the second thing I think about fasting because of the period of Great Land and Father Phil the question that Father Philip asked. Um, we have to return uh, to a uh, to an ancient uh, um, uh, vision of uh, fasting, which is actually quite different from what uh, uh, from what we have now. Uh, in Didache, uh, we have an interesting phrase, uh, fast uh, for your enemies. So uh, it's, it's, uh, it could not be just the, the, the ascetical practice of just sort of balancing your sort of body and spirit, uh, but uh, fasting could be a kind of prayer. Uh, and um, uh, I think it's important to remember this also. And uh, acts of mercy, I think uh, uh, acts of mercy are important today. Ukraine is suffering. Ukraine really needs uh, uh, humanitarian aid. Uh, it needs uh, our uh, support, uh, any kind of support. Uh, the, the, the situation is terrible. I'm, I'm in touch with my friends in uh, different Ukrainian cities almost every day. And they say that, uh, well, uh, nobody is, is working there, uh, but they still have to eat and they, they, they will spend, all of my friends say that uh, they have uh, money for, for a few weeks actually to, to buy food for, for three, four weeks maximum. Uh, so uh, uh, it's a humanitarian catastrophe um, and uh, we definitely have to help them. Um, yes, I, I, I'm very moved by my, my friends' kind of remarks and, and the questions everyone has said. Um, I, would, I would say that this is, you know, with every, um, going back to the, the root of the word, I mean, with every type of crisis, there is a, a revelation uh, and, and an opportunity. And um, uh, one of the opportunities for orthodoxy and and here i would say is is uh, here i i talk about the actual orthodox church not just you know whether you're russian orthodox or one of the different churches in the ep is is that we begin to see ourselves truly as a church and not um uh sort of uphold our different jurisdictions uh you know, almost like we, you know, I have tattooed on my arm, you know, EP. Um, and to truly actually live as um, the body of the living Christ, Le Corps de Christ Vivant. Here I'm thinking of Florovsky's famous essay. And to act as a Christian body. So this is um, something which I think that we're called to always, but especially now. And to do that requires um, facing a world which has been, for better or for worse, transformed uh, by the West, by um, what Heidegger called the, the age of the world picture, um, by all the, the good and the bad that have come from the West, by capitalism, by, you know, the populism by democracy all these things they're they're good and bad this is the world that we live in it's a modern world it's a secular world but it, it, we don't necessarily have to just accept that as it is we can bring it within the bosom of 
Christ's body and transform it. That is a creative process. We can have, and this may sound like a contradiction in terms, a type of orthodox secularity, a type of vision of the modern, which um, is comes from within the depths of our tradition that has been prayed through. I think there's a, a, a Slavonic word for, for that. Um, you'll know that, sister. And so this is, I think, something that we need to think about. And, and this is the hardest part, and I may get in trouble for this. We need to, to, com to completely rethink our ecclesiology, which worships bishops. This is not Christian. And I would say um, it's not just uh, clerics like myself, although I don't think of myself as a cleric, I guess I am, um, who are responsible for this. It is, in a way, the expectation from the laity, which is pushed onto those who end up being bishops. They're elevated as idols. They're made into idols. So the church needs to, in this sense, uh, it cannot become subornal until that uh, subornicity um, is, as it were, something which everyone has responsibility for, and, and it begins with the lay. So, yeah, that would be my final words on all of this. Um, I do hope that the declaration, which I was just one small part of, is is that it's very clear that this is, is something which is directed to all Orthodox. It's not an anti-Russian document. It's a call for Orthodoxy as a whole, as the body of the living Christ, to bow down and to repent. Thank you. Thank you to all of our panelists. Um, we're so grateful that you're able to join us. Um, uh, just a, a note of housekeeping, this was recorded. We will try to process that as soon as possible and post it on incommunion.org. Um, this was not the first webinar we've held and hopefully it's not the last. So if your question wasn't addressed, hopefully um, it, you'll be able to join us again, uh, whatever our next uh, webinar is. Um, I'll endeavor to save the chat and share it with our panelists as well. Um, and my, my final thought is just, um, I'll, I hope we can all join in prayer for peace together that not by our own hands, um, but through our hands, by the will of God, uh, peace will reign in our world. Thank you all very much. Thank you.